airplanes are airtight, but why do our buildings have to be airtight? And is it even healthy to live in an airtight building? Nowadays, building professionals focus a lot on thermal insulation, but forget something very important, namely airtightness. And that's exactly what we're going to explore in this video. My name is Anton Dobrovsky, I'm a past house trainer, and I've taught hundreds of building professionals how to design healthy and energy efficient buildings. And before answering the question, what is airtightness? It is important to take a step back and understand what the building envelope is and what its functions are. So the building envelope is what encloses our building. It is the boundary between the inside and the outside environment and is made of the exterior walls, the roof and the floor slab. And it should be designed in a way to act as our first line of defense and shield us from the forces of nature. Because if uncontrolled, these natural elements could compromise the integrity of the building, but also our health and comfort. So there are four elements we should look at. The most challenging and crucial one is water. Of course, we want our homes to be waterproof so that they protect us from the rain and snow, because otherwise we'll have a leaky building and when it's raining outside, it will be raining inside as well. The second one is air. Story time! When I was young, I loved running around the apartment, but I had the habit not to close the doors. And my parents were always saying to me, were you born in a cave? Close the door, we're paying for the heating. And now I understand why they were mad at me, because when the door was open, the warm air could easily escape from the room in which the heating was working. And that's because the air carries the heat with it. But the same happens on the smaller scale as well. So if the wall is not airtight, the air will pass through the gaps in the wall and it will take out the heat from the inside. Then third, we have vapor. Vapor are small water particles that go through the wall and we should protect the structure and the materials inside the wall because otherwise this vapor will start building up, it will condensate and lead to damage and mold growth. Last, but certainly not least, is thermal control. This keeps us warm in winter and cool in the summers, and the way our buildings manage thermal energy significantly impacts our comfort and the energy efficiency of the building. But it is also important to respect the order of the four control layers, because if we don't control water, it doesn't matter if we control air and vapor, but also air, in most cases, is more important to control than vapor. And if we don't control the first three, it doesn't really matter how much insulation we have. So having all that said, let's go back to the initial question. What is air tightness? Air tightness, in simple terms, is the reduction of unintentional air leakage through the building envelope. So it is about keeping uncontrolled air, both hot and cold, from infiltrating through the envelope like the walls, roof, and floor of a building. Let me show you what I mean. Here, I have two balloons, and I will try to blow them up. Let's start with the blue one. Okay, this doesn't work. Let's try the red one. This time it worked. So what is the difference between both? I can blow up the blue one because it has some holes in it and all the air that's in the balloons is like the energy that you pay for to heat and cool your house. As you can see, when I blow up the red balloon, the air stays inside, meaning that all the air that we're heating up stays in the building. The blue balloon, on the other hand, is not airtight, meaning there are punctuations in the airtight layer, and therefore the air just goes out of the balloon and I have to keep blowing up to keep some air inside. And it's the same with our buildings. While the insulation or the thermal control keeps the heat inside, so does the air tightness. Because no matter how well a building is insulated, the air will still go through the walls if the building is not airtight. But you might be asking, why is air coming in or going out a problem? Well, for starters, as already mentioned, it can lead to increased energy use and higher costs. So let's visualize it. This graph clearly shows the linear correlation between how airtight the building is and how much energy the building spends for heating. So buildings with poor airtightness consume a lot more energy compared to airtight buildings. And the effects of airtightness don't stop there. It also has significant implications on our health, comfort, and even the lifespan of our buildings. When we have a building that isn't airtight, it can let in pollutants from the outside like dust, allergens, even pollutants from traffic or industry can make their way into the home. 
and these pollutants can have a detrimental effect on the indoor air quality and consequentially our health as well. And it's not just outdoor pollutants we need to worry about. Inside in winter time, it's gonna be hot, maybe a bit humid as well, as we are cooking, cleaning, taking showers. And when this warm air goes through the wall, what do you think is gonna happen? Excess humidity can creep in through those leaks, going to find a cold spot, a cold condensing surface, which could then lead to moisture depositing in our walls. And moisture then leads to mold growth. And as many of us know, mold can trigger a lot of health issues from allergic reactions and asthma attacks to more severe respiratory conditions. On top of that, condensation within the building envelope increases the risk of damage to the structure as well. But before I explain this, if you like this video and want to learn more about designing healthy and energy efficient buildings, make sure to subscribe. So condensation is caused by the buildup of vapor and there are two ways in which vapor can move through our walls. One method is vapor diffusion, where vapor naturally moves from areas of high moisture concentration to areas of low moisture concentration, going through the microscopic spaces in the materials. The second way is through air. Basically, the warm air carries the moisture. Let's take it a step further. Over the course of the heating period or one winter, through one square meter or 10 square feet of wall area, how much water can diffuse or how much water can go through the buildup, through the molecules of the materials. That's about 100 milliliters of water or about this much. But what would happen if we have a hole in the wall? In every building there are holes, penetrations for cables, pipes, etc. Well, if we have a one square centimeter gap, which is around one fifth of a square inch, we'll have this much water. going through the structure, which is around five liters of water or 50 times more. And it's only through one square centimeter. If we have a bigger gap, let's say six square centimeters or around one square inch, which is quite realistic, we would have 30 liters of water going through the wall, which is 300 times more compared to the situation where we don't have any gaps. Just imagine all this water is being dumped into the wall over the course of a heating period. And this water starts accumulating in the walls and that's when problems start occurring. That's why we want to make the buildings airtight and prevent warm air from going into the construction and carrying all this moisture. And let me put that back. And air tightness is not just about keeping things out. It's also about keeping things in. And by things, I mean your comfort. Have you ever been in a building where you sit next to the window and you're cold because the cold wind is coming through the window? We've all been there. And that's why in a drafty, leaky building, it's harder to maintain a comfortable, consistent temperature. You could be boiling one moment and freezing the next, but in an airtight building, you get a much more consistent, comfortable indoor climate because airtight buildings are draft-free buildings. So as we can see, airtightness is more than just a matter of energy efficiency. It affects our health, our comfort, and even the durability of our buildings. But how do we achieve air tightness? And what are some challenges that we might encounter along the way? Well, good air tightness starts from the drawing board, and this is of critical importance. After all, this planning is the prerequisite for implementing a high quality airtight building envelope in a cost-effective and unproblematic manner on the building site. So where does the airtight layer go? The airtight layer should be on the, remember, more hot and humid side of the building. So for example, in cold climates like Switzerland, Norway, Canada, which are heating dominated climates, we want to stop the warm and humid air from the inside to, from escaping the building, but we also don't want it to get into the walls because otherwise we're going to have problems with moisture and mold. Therefore, the airtight layer for cold climates should be on the inside. And for hot and humid climates, the airtight layer, which will also act as a vapor barrier, should be on the outside, because outside we have much more humid environment, while the inside air is conditioned. And remember that the airtight layer should fully enclose the heated volume of the building. So garages and unconditioned attics should not be included within the airtight layer and we should have a single continuous airtight layer. And for this, we should use the pencil rule. 
Namely, along all the plants and sections of the building, we should take a pencil and start drawing a line along the heated building envelope. Wherever something happens with the envelope, for example, a pipe goes through it, the material changes, or the direction changes, make a circle. And for all these places and all these circles, make detailed drawings of 1 to 10 or 1 to 5 and make it clear which materials and which components form the airtight layer so that it is continuous all around. And penetrations are possible. However, they should be planned and suitably detailed to ensure that the penetrations aren't a cause of unintended air leakage. When it comes to the exact materials and methods, there is no one-size-fits-all solution here because every building is unique with its own design, construction and materials. And airtime construction can be formed by many different materials and components, such as cross-laminated timber or CLT, OSB of suitable thicknesses, plaster on masonry construction, reinforced concrete, but of course, specially designed airtight membranes. And the airtight layer doesn't have to be made of the same material all around. For example, on the floor, the concrete could be the airtight layer, while on the walls and the roof, the CLT. But it's not only important to consider which materials will act as the airtight layer, but also how the different materials will be joined up and connected with each other because there shouldn't be any gaps in the airtight layer. And for these connections and penetrations, there are special tapes and components that we can use. And of course, no matter how well the drawings and details are made, if they're not properly implemented on site, the building will not be airtight. A brilliant design only goes so far. Execution is key. Therefore, when the building is completed, a blower or test should be done. And this allows us to measure the airtightness of the building, but also potentially find some leaks in the building envelope. So airtightness requires careful planning and execution, but its benefits from energy savings and improved comfort to healthier indoor air definitely make it a goal worth striving for. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, here's where it gets a bit tricky. On one hand, we should make our buildings airtight. On the other hand, we should make sure they're well ventilated. Think of it this way, if we completely seal off a room, the air inside will become stale and we need fresh air for our health and comfort. So when we talk about air tightness, we need to talk about it hand in hand with effective ventilation. That's why we say build tight and ventilate right. And if you want to learn what the best way is to ventilate your building, make sure to check out this video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.